firm providing doormen to clubs in and around Essex, including the infamous Raquel's in Basildon. In Raquel's, it was like everyone was on the drugs. Doorman was selling drugs. I'm not saying what doorman, but the doorman was selling drugs. And half the time, it was Tony's gear they were selling. Well, the business they were in were, were in pills, in ecstasy pills, that they were distributed to, to clubs. Within the clubs, dealers controlled the sale of drugs, but the doorman controlled the dealers. Tony Tucker took a cut from every deal. You've got to put your people in, and their job is to stop anyone else dealing in the club, and then split the profits, or give them a percentage of the profits, a third, whatever. Tucker was good at getting other people to do his bidding. He was manipulative and he fooled probably a lot of people um, into thinking that he was a good friend to them, whereas basically he was a user. That's all he was, he was a user and a bully. To help run his empire, Tucker had an enforcer, Craig Rolfe, whose life started badly and then went downhill. He was born in Holloway Prison to a mother who was serving a long sentence in connection with the murder of Rolf's father. The impression I had of Rolf was that um, he was a very obliging sort of guy, would do anything. He was a sort of golfer, you know, and uh, he liked to be on the fringes of things. He wasn't really a villain. Rolf was also an increasingly enthusiastic user, especially of steroids and cocaine. Many people take cocaine, and they enjoy taking it, it gives them energy, makes them feel lively and happy. Unfortunately, when aggressive people take a cane, it makes aggressive people more aggressive. Even more feared as an enforcer in the organization was Pat Tate, a man who during one of his frequent stays in prison met Tucker on one of his rare stretches inside. <sighs> Pat Tate was a 20 stone steroid Monster. He was, he was, he's actually a nice looking guy, Pat was. Tate and Tucker were both heavy users of steroids. Tate's behavior was unpredictable at best, psychotic at worst. Steroids tend to make people more irritable, more aggressive, more combative, and if you already have a personality that is volatile and aggressive and dominant, then it's likely to make that person more aggressive and dominant. Someone taking large amounts of steroids, large amounts of cocaine, that's going to result in all manner of difficulties. Tate and Tucker definitely had difficulties over their business methods when buying and selling drugs. There was certainly no honor among these thieves. Their speciality was robbing people. They would make a meet with some people who were selling, say, cocaine, They'd meet them at the motorway services and get them to meet one side of the service while they were the other side of the service. They'd cross over and say they were going to leave someone there while they went across and checked the uh, commodity. Well, when they got to the other side, they'd just take off. Pat Tate's fearsome bulk might be helpful when it came to robbing drug dealers of their wares, but his erratic behaviour was now turning him into a liability. Pat Tate was basically a bodybuilder. Got all on the steroids and basically a bully. He went in a pizza house, smacked the bloke around because he was a fool. The pizza manager received this treatment just for speaking without respect to Tate on the telephone when he placed a pizza order for something not on the menu. You just had to be careful what you said because it doesn't matter who you was, um, they would have a go. Even old friendships couldn't save someone if they got on the wrong side of the Tucker-Tate combo, as Steve Nipper Ellis discovered when he made the mistake of discussing Tucker's whereabouts with one girlfriend to another. Tony's walked in, and I was, I was hoovering, doing my cleaning up, doing my housework, and Tony said, so I stopped the hoover, Tony said to me, where's the thing? Which he meant the 2-2 two -two revolver. So I got the 2 2 revolver out from under the stairs where it was hidden, give it to him, said it's clean and it's loaded, I've, I've checked it. With that, he's got the gun in, gun in his right hand, uh, he's pushed me back against the wall and started uh, banging the gun in my head. And I just thought I'm dead. And so I kept thinking I'm dead because I knew it was loaded. Having made his escape from the gun-toting Tucker, Ellis later decided to exact revenge. 
Last time I see Pat was just after I'd shot him and he was in the kitchen window when I tried to shoot him then and he ran down the hall. Last time I see Tony it was after I tried to shoot him and as I was driving out of town trying to find their car, their car's come out of a, onto a T-junction and I see them, they see me, but I'd driven past them and then they were staying behind me and each time I was going to get out of the car and run back and shoot them, they were reversing on a main road, so that was the last time I see him. Bleeding from his gunshot wound, a hospitalised Tate then tried to lure Ellis to his bedside, where he had hidden a gun. Apparently he went down for an operation or something and the nurse was changing his bed and she found the gun under the bed and uh, Pat got nicked for having the gun and he ended up going back in prison on breach of his parole. Um, there was me, run, like a lunatic, running around with a shotgun. With violence becoming an increasingly common part of their armoury, Tony Tucker's firm was about to enter choppy waters. But for now, the importing of their drugs seemed to be plain sailing. The, obviously, the, the drugs was coming across the channel in a, in a rib, you know, a semi-rib inflatable. And um, that's, that's, it, obviously, Essex is an easy route across. So someone could make a serious lot of money by taking that across. While in jail, Tate had met someone who could help the Essex boys make serious money. That someone was Michael Steele, a sailor with his own boat, who was already in the illegal drugs importation game. Uh, Michael Steele was not a gang member. He was a professional drug dealer, a very intelligent man, a very, very quali well qualified engineer, charming at times and ruthless at other times. He was an organizer and a leader. Steele was also a pilot and often flew the drugs into improvised landing strips and former World War II air bases across Essex, Norfolk and Kent. Mick Steele wasn't fancy cars or Porsches or Jaguars or anything like that. He had his own truck where he'd done his own engineering work. You know, he wasn't, you know, the big drug baron. He, that wasn't Mickey Steele. Steele was the architect of the smuggling operations and worked with Jack Wombs, who looked after storage and distribution of the drugs once in Essex. Jack Wombs, a large built man, he was a steadfast rock for Steele. He was his lieutenant who did as he was told and supported Michael Steele in dishonest activities. Him and Jack got on well because they were both engineers, they were always talking engines and, you know, which didn't interest me. The final member of the Essex boys was Darren Nichols. He too had met Steele, Wombs and Tate at Hollisley Bay Jail. Darren Nichols, a married man with uh, children, as far as my memory serves me, a couple of daughters, held a regular job down then got involved in uh, some dishonest behaviour and as a result of that, met up with uh, Michael Steele. Steele and Wombs brought in and distributed some of the drugs sold in the Essex clubs, where the doors were controlled by Tucker and his bouncers. In the second half of 1995, Tucker increasingly supplemented his sales of cannabis with the clubber's favourite, ecstasy. To keep up with demand, he found himself a new supplier who sold him ecstasy pills known as apples. These are extra potent and could pose a very real danger for the less sophisticated Essex clubber. Apple ecstasy has a reputation of being a particularly strong form of ecstasy. But one of the problems with buying an ecstasy pill is that there are so many different ones around and they change almost every week and you don't really know what's in them. And there are variations in the strength that they contain. So you, there's no great quality control. Meanwhile, Tucker's doorman ensured only their dealers were allowed to supply drugs in the clubs where they supplied the doorman. If anyone else went into a nightclub and started selling their own particular drugs, the doorman would stop them 
They'd take their drugs off of them, give them a clump and chuck them out. In 1995, it seemed that the only way in Essex to conduct nefarious business was to pay one's dues to the so-called Essex boys. But was their reign of terror about to be challenged? And where would it lead? One time I made a meeting with, uh, with um, Tate because Tucker wouldn't come to the meeting. So he sent Tate. That's when I did say to him, the way you're going, you know what's going to happen. Someone's going to creep up behind you and go bump in the back of the head. I was going to do that to Tucker. And when you're with him, same's going to happen to you. And that's when he looked me in the eye and said, well, if it happens, it happens. Three days later, it happened. The field in which the plane will be landing the following day is just at the end of the lane. Craig was driving, Tony was next to him in the passenger seat, Pat was in the back with somebody. They drove down the Rittenden Turnpike, they was looking for what they, Tony, Pat and Craig, believe was another easy job, to mug some dealers, take a load of stuff. The entrance is being barred by a securely locked gate. Pat's seen the pump action, gone like that. Bang, Craig, bang, Tony, Craig. Tony and Craig didn't know a thing. They, I mean, you think of a loud bang in that confined space, you're gonna like, you wouldn't even know, they didn't even know what happened. They were dead before they even heard the second sound of the gun. The people were waiting where they thought they were gonna have the switch over. Instead of getting the commodity, they got killed because uh, obviously the people whose toes they were treading on were heavy people. Yeah, it was only a matter of time women three got killed. Just a matter of time because I was catching everybody, having everybody over, just chucking away about in general where they could. Well, what's got them killed was obviously greed. They'd been doing this, they'd been tucking people up. And uh, that was the, uh, the carrot that was put under the front of the donkey's nose. It was a big one. And uh, they threw caution to the wind and just went for it, which the people obviously knew that they would. They might indeed have been tempted by the carrot of a million pound drop. Shared with their old enemies and supposedly current cronies, the East London gang, and then paid for their greed with their lives. But what really happened that fateful December night in 1995? My brother Jack, uh, of, the, of the morning of the murders, um, Darren Nichols, the supergrass, rung Jack up and said, my car's broken down on the way to work. And he said, would you pick it up, Jack? And Jack said, no, Darren, I'm working on the docks, and which he was. He said, I'll pick it up later. Darren? Where are you, buddy? Just before 7 p.m. on the evening of the murders, the records show two four-second calls were made by Wombs to Nichols. The prosecution alleged that they were made by Wombs to summon the getaway vehicle after the murder. But were they? After Jack had finished work, he goes and gets Darren's car and rings Darren up and says, Darren, I've got your car. I'll take it back to the workshop. And Darren said, fine. And that's what Jack done, brought the car back to the workshop. That's where they say that Jack rung Darren to say, I've just shot him, come and get me. Neither side could conclusively prove what was said. But it gave the prosecution a corroborating factor in placing the men in conversation at the time. It was essential evidence because it corroborated a lot of the evidence that Darren Nichols would give and was, was proved to be correct. And it also had him, Nichols, in touch with Steele and Wombs prior to and at the time of the murders being committed. They'd done a lot of drug deals. 
And they, not only when they'd done drug deals, they'd actually gone to the drug deals, taken drugs, taken the money what they've gone there to buy the drug with, and left. However, Tucker didn't always check the provenance of the dealers he had robbed and beaten. Some were well-connected with rival outfits based in London's East End and Tilbury Docks. So there was a history of bad blood. Tate Tucker and Rolf was shot with the most precision you could ever see. You know, it wasn't... It, 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 it was a marksman that shot those three guys. The bloody execution of three of the Essex boys' gang led to a massive police investigation. This threw a spotlight on the Essex underworld and on the police to make arrests. If three people get executed in a ga what is obviously a gang killing, and it's in the context of a drug scene out there in Essex, which was widely known about to be pretty bad and pretty out of control, you can take it as read that very, very senior people in the Home Office and the police forces, quite possibly outside Essex, will make phone calls and say, I don't know what's going on down there, but will somebody please sort this out? I think the police knew right from the start that they'd been killed by people who knew them well, so they were already looking at a limited number of people in that particular underworld. Essex police had encouraged Darren Nichols to become a supergrass, and he, in turn, had identified Michael Steele and Jack Wombs as the two murderers. But without any corroborating evidence, it took nearly two years to bring the case to trial. There were no forensics, no footprints, no DNA. Nothing to connect Steele and Wombs directly to the murders. The barrister, who subsequently acted for Michael Steele in his attempts to get the case appealed, finds this strange. The allegation was that the killers of the three men in the vehicle had crossed a field um, which was, was covered in snow, um, that around the car there would have been footprints, um, that uh, there were sweetie papers in the back of a car um, in which it was claimed that my client had travelled and yet there was no DNA found. On the floor there was a crisp packet and a topic wrapper. Now, if there was no DNA at the scene, at the scene, how did someone eat all them crisps? So there was DNA there. There was not a scintilla of, of DNA evidence. All of it is absurd. I mean, it really is strange that there was no science. No science. But was it that odd? When the police arrived at the scene uh, where the Range Rover was with the three bodies inside, it had been snowing but a thaw had set in. So had there been any evidence within the snow, it could have evaporated away, as it were. Who is to say that uh, the two witnesses who found um, the bodies, when they arrived, and they clearly had to go to the Range Rover, they looked around, so their footprints could, in, in fact, have damaged possibly some uh, evidence that may have been there. But some things were undisputedly a bit odd that fateful night. Tate Tuck and Rolf um, went down that lane unarmed. They were villains known to have weapons around them. But why would they go down that lane if they was going to a drug deal or attempt a drug deal or even to a double cross, what they say? Why did they not go with guns? There was no guns at the scene. Failing any forensics, the key evidence was the word of Darren Nichols. Nichols, who claims to have been the driver for Wombs and Steele on the night of the events, was later caught transporting a large amount of cannabis in the boot of his car. It seems that the police took a lenient view of this and offered other perks. Without any forensic evidence, Nichols' evidence was crucial for the prosecution. This was a case which was quite unusual in that the absolute core of the evidence against the men in the dog was the evidence of an informer, um, the, uh, the evidence of somebody who had uh, himself been a criminal, who was himself somebody who had been involved in serious crime. He basically did a deal that he would uh, give evidence against others in order to save his own skin. Obviously he didn't do it for nothing. 
He was the sort of man, probably, that uh, would do anything rather than go in prison. He knew that he was also in the frame, quite possibly, as somebody who was party to murder, multiple murders. He, that was the great threat that hung over him.